welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. Fridays are a great day for me. I don't know about you, Tony, but I get to spend 30 minutes just plumbing the, the brain of you and getting your wisdom. And I love it, love it, love it. Thank you. Thank you again for, for having me on. I love Fridays too. I look forward to this every single week. And I look forward to some of the challenging topics and, and the conversations that we have. So uh, yeah, grateful to be here. Thanks again. Well, we're, today we're going to talk about something. When is it okay to release a donor? When I first met the great uh, Terry Axelrod, who created uh, Raising More Money and then Benavon, um, mm -hmm. I was a young board member and I had been sent to her training, you know, trainings. And uh, she came up with this phrase, bless and release. Um, and it really, it really hit me. And it was the whole concept was, you know, you're not a good fit for us now. We're not a good fit for you now, but um, go forth and do great things. <laughs> and, and it was just such an interesting thing that it was always stuck in my mind. And so I really was looking forward to having this conversation with you about what it could really look like and, and how we should be thinking about it. So our topic today is when is it okay to release a donor? And we'll get more into what that actually means. Um, again, we have the blessings of great sponsors and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. Our co-hosts are amazing today. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, here with Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy. And uh, the rest of our co-hosts are amazing, but uh, I think Tony and I have a special bond because I'm always like, Tony, what do you think? You know. <laughs> so this is really a fun thing to have him with me um, to get going. So. Let's start off with what does it mean to you, Tony, to release a donor? Yeah, what does it mean to release a donor? And, and you and I talked a little bit about this in, in the green room. Uh, and so total, you know, total transparency, I've never released a donor, but certainly have had experiences where I've thought about <laughs> what would be the process for releasing a donor and have certainly you know, heard many stories from others about releasing a donor. And I like to think of it more of redirecting a donor than releasing a donor, because I, I feel like as ambassadors for the nonprofit sector, uh, it's important that we do everything we can to keep folks engaged and kind of moving forward on their philanthropic journey uh, if they've selected to kind of go down that, you know, go down that road. Uh, so what does it mean to release a donor? I think what that means is uh, coming to a point of uh, truth uh, where you realize that the alignment of donor needs and your organization are no longer where they might have been when the donor first came on board with the organization. And it's having those conversations and realizing those truths and then seeing how we can if, if there's no other option, when you say that, how can we redirect this donor to another organization uh, that they can be equally passionate about uh, and that can continue to meet their changing needs as a donor? So that's what I think about when I think about what does it mean to, to release a donor? Yeah, I think that's a, I love what you said, and I think it's really important for the sector as whole of as the whole is that you know it's a fit it's an issue of fit but don't don't stop being a philanthropist you know move yeah, on exactly and how can you continue to and i loved what you said find another organization where you have a shared passion or interest and then and then go from there um, because mm -hmm. to me that you know we we want to cultivate philanthropy across our communities and our, mm -hmm. our, our American culture, because it's so unique. It's so unique how we do things here compared to the rest of the world for many it, it reasons. Is, 
It, it is so unique. And the other thing that I, I think I, I failed to mention in, in, in my initial thoughts is that when we talk about releasing a donor, and it's no different than if, if you're releasing an employee, a team member, uh, if you're releasing a contractor or a service provider, you want to do so with the highest level of dignity and respect, uh, you know, for the individual. So just, you know, that was just something that I failed to mention, uh, but, you know, because release is a strong word and we just want to make sure that we continue to treat folks with the level of dignity and respect uh, that they deserve for what they have done historically to support your organization and make your community better. Right. And I love that you said that because I think that's true to the concept of community building and how we we encourage our our citizenry citizenry in a civil way to you know support things and so mm -hmm. so let's dig down a little deeper what are the situations that could lead to you know ending a donor relationship um what does that look like and what have you seen yeah so what i've seen i, I see this happening from my experience, and again, from some of the, the stories that have been shared with me, yeah. this tends to happen at the higher level of donor, more so than kind of your mid-level, okay. you know, kind of lower level, all very important, you know, donors when you look at, at who's contributing to your organization. So this tends to happen at the higher level. And, and that tends to happen because uh, when we, when we, have donors that are contributing a lot. And when we think of them as investors for the cause, sometimes uh, the lines can be blurred around the level of contribution that that donor should be making on a day-to-day -day basis. So sometimes a, a high-level donor will want to uh, make decisions around staffing, will mm. want to make decisions around the mission or the direction of a program. And so then you might have to kind of pull back a little bit and have a conversation with that donor to kind of remind them really what is the mission and vision of the organization and what the role is of the professionals that have been hired to manage, run, and lead the day-to-day uh, operations of, of the organization. So that's one situation in particular that I think leads to ending a donor relation. Something may come up with that donor um, that no longer aligns with the ethics of your organization. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you may have to, and these are tough, tough conversations, uh, but right. you, you have to, you know, protect your organization, you have to protect your mission because the services that you're providing to the community are vital. Uh, and so sometimes you, you have to have these tough conversations in order to protect the mission of the organization and the community that you're serving. But again, sometimes something might come up with a donor uh, where the ethics no longer align uh, with, with the organization. So let's dig a little deeper and talk about that because I'm thinking of an organization that I was somewhat involved with in my own community who had a um, major donor, a transformative gift that was well over a million dollars for this organization. And this uh, business owner, an entrepreneur, had made um, their money in a fashion that um, didn't align with the mission and the and the, the the client profile and so there was a sense that it was uh, and i want to use the word it was like a syntax right it was a they had made their money with what several people on the board or the in leadership felt like was um you know a sinful product right and i don't know mm -hmm. how to phrase that i think um, no I, I totally i think you did that beautifully yes so um this gift would have transformed the organization and allowed them to take their programming to a, another level. And the board members, the majority of the board members said, no, we, we will not take this gift. 
And um, the CEO and the C-suite said, if you don't take the gift, we're all going to quit. So they had all met and said, you know, because this is a transformative situation for us and that it was a, a starting point too. They felt like that million dollars was going to roll into many other gifts based on their conversations and what they were doing with this, this family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it caused a community stink because <laughs> everybody else was coming back to their own organizations and saying, holy cow, you know, what's our gift acceptance policy? This organization didn't have one. Mm -hmm. And so it got down to like, if you sell alcohol or tobacco, if you are involved with selling firearms, if you sell pornography, if you, I, I mean, it got onto mm -hmm. so many different topics and it reverberated Tony throughout our community. And to this day, when something a little wonky happens, this story, this lore <laughs> is repeated, right? And everybody talks about it. So, you know, how, how do you see this? Well, I, I think you brought up something really important that should be mentioned here, and that is the creation of giving guidelines uh, for your organization and, and what is that gift acceptance policy. Uh, a lot of organizations don't do that. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, with, with the Internet and AI, you can find a policy like that uh, that you can easily uh, modify to kind of suit um, the ethics and, and vision of of your organization. So I think that's a first really good step, Julia, to preventing that from, you know, from happening. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, you know, when, when we talk about transparency and, and ethics and fundraising, I mean, I could probably sit here and think of a couple of other creative ways <laughs> to still have accepted those funds without the publicity or the branding uh, that might have come along with a, a gift that uh, the community might have, you know, felt came from uh, not the best source, uh, but but that's not the space we're in. And and so, you know, I I respect in in the case that you brought up, I respect the kind of position of staff. I mean, they're looking at this and and yeah. you know, salivating like, wow, what we can do with this. And, and what it can mean for the community. And our board is saying, no, uh, right. I, you know, I understand that. But I, I really think at the end of the day, the board made the right decision. Unless, you know, unless you're willing to just kind of like button it up and say, we're going to take it and we're going to deal with whatever, you know, whatever the fallout might be. And we're going to have a communication plan to support why we accepted this gift. And especially in, you know, in certain communities where uh, where there is a lot of chatter, uh, you just, you know, you need to be prepared if you're if you're going to kind of accept a gift that you already know may be a bit controversial. OK, then let me throw this one at you. Uh -oh. I'm thinking of I know this is one of my favorites and I think about this a lot. You know, I'm kind of a geek, so I think about weird things. But, you know, the Carnegie Library System is one of the great um, philanthropic endeavors of the starting of America, really, through the industrial age. Um, libraries were part private. Um, the Carnegie Library System was created. A community would have to guarantee, you know, land and so much structure and this and that. And then the Carnegie Group. Carnegie group would basically match it. Many, many people believe that that was a redemption gift, a redemption gift based on a phenomenal labor unrest that ended with a lot of lives lost throughout the Carnegie investments. And that's, mm -hmm. an, again, that's another discussion. But what if this isn't a, uh, you find somebody that has a redemptive motivation, you know, that they, invested or did something in their life that they they weren't that proud of but they benefited economically and then they want to return that i have been a part of something like that i've been a part of a of a, a 
well, multi-million dollar gift where um, I was brought in to talk to this man. He seemed very humble. And, you know, I was the person sent forward to, you know, do the deed. And he witnessed to me that he had, it, he had had, he was dealing with some shame um, and the largesse, the financial gains that he met or that he, he had grown um, were not so savory. They weren't illegal. They were more what we would call, you know, a sin product. And um, mm -hmm. in his remaining years, um, he had lost his wife. He didn't have a relationship with his children. And he thought that this was something that would re redeem him. Mm -hmm. And it was really powerful. And I was stuck in a situation in a, we were in a restaurant of all places. <laughs> and I was like, Okay, I didn't, I mean, mentally, I'm like, oh, no, no, you know, I didn't expect that. I felt like this man was in pain. And I'll be really candid with you, Tony. Mm -hmm. I felt like maybe we shouldn't take that money. Mm -hmm. Like, like maybe <laughs> that maybe he needed help. And this was not the right way to do it. Mm. And we did take his money and we did have a relationship with him and he did support us. And with a lot more money over the years, he would come quietly to events and things. But I sensed that this man had some demons, you know, and um, I felt a little unseemly about about being a part of that that ask. <laughs> Yeah, that's quite the story, Julia. I know. So I'll, look, I'm I'll, look forward, <laughs> I'll look forward to to more of those in your next book. Uh, there's those types of stories. I know. Uh, I wasn't going to share that, but it just like came up. I'm sorry. Fridays are good. No, you no, no, no. It's it's it, it's. I mean, it's you know, other folks I'm sure have that same experience. Uh, as donors, we're all motivated in different ways to contribute. To nonprofit organizations, uh, and so he just happened to have a, a a very kind of unique motivation based on what we typically experience in in fundraising. Uh, I would, you, I love people, <laughs> and I love people that evolve to be better people. Uh, so I would celebrate him all day long. Uh, again, not part of the conversation, need to know more, you know, but, yeah, no, no, but, no, but, but, right. but on the service, I would yeah. celebrate him all day long for at least wanting to have some accountability for, mm -hmm. you know, past behaviors or decisions that at this point in his or her or they, their life, mm -hmm. they um, feel differently about. Yeah. Well, you know, you're a lovely man. And that's, a, that's a, um, to me, that's a perspective of grace, right? right. That, that you, you look at this and, um, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's such an interesting thing. We don't often talk about donor motivation, right? <laughs> we, we talk about the donor checkbook <laughs> and just to say, you know, to really dig down a little bit deeper. I think we, we need, we need to do that. Well, let's get into this next level because I think this is fascinating. Um, how do donor agreements factor into the process? Um, again, working with another organization in my community um, who didn't have what they called then a bad boy clause um, that, uh, and this involved an, an individual who um, had naming rights on a particular mm. cam campus, public campus. Um, got into some hot water, legal troubles, um, and then their name was up in lights and the organization wanted to distance and distance themselves. Um, it involved a judicial piece. Um, it was for drunk driving and they had a component of alcohol, you know, issues within the organization felt like alcohol contributed a lot to their clients' problems. So they could they could draw a line to, you know, that issue, but they mm -hmm. didn't have any agreement in place. Mm -hmm. And so they they had to kind of live with it. I think this happens a lot. 
And I'm wondering what you think, because I think it could go the other way too, to protect the donor. Yeah, absolutely. So again, in, in my experience, whenever I've been involved in any naming of anything, there has always been a donor agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm not an attorney, uh, but there are typically, you know, clauses that where there's an out clause or based on X, Y, and Z, uh, the organization may decide to uh, remove the name from the building. Uh, you know, who, if the building gets sold, you know, I mean, there, there are all of these variables that need to be included in that agreement. Uh, but even though there is an agreement, uh, and again, we're talking about, you know, high level donors, if, if we're yeah. talking about, you know, naming rights and, and these types of agreements. Um, but they they are often something that can be subtly referred to when you have that high end donor that is wanting to make decisions around staffing or wanting to make decisions around marketing or, or whatever that might be uh, around the day-to-day -day operations of, of the organization. So uh, it can it can protect the organization and prevent you from being in this space where now you have to start having this conversation about potentially releasing or redirecting this donor because somewhere along the line, they have uh, developed this sense of empowerment that is not beneficial to the organization's desired outcomes. And you know, Tony, you you said something really magical there because I think in the for-profit world, that's what happens. You know, you score the big sale, you make the, get the great contract, you know, and and you move up and you you elevate your your level of power and influence, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that's I true. think it's I don't think it's necessarily like evil or vicious. I just think it's a methodology that, um, you know, I'm dare I say older, you know, leaders are used to. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so then when they, they make an investment in the for-profit world treated one way, they make an investment in the nonprofit world. They're like, wait a minute, this is, this is what I know. This is how I, you know, I think I should go. So well, I love what you said about this. Well, I think, and what you said too, Joy, they typically, these folks are bringing a lot of experience yeah. along with their financial contribution or investment. So, uh, so if they see something that they feel should be modified, they're going to be compelled to share that with you based on, you know, their, their, their lived experience. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's such an interesting, interesting con conversation. We relationships, have... relationships, relationships. It's all about relationships. <laughs> you are right, my friend. You are right. Well, let's go to this last question then. How in, in that spectrum of relationships, how do we know if it's just me and it's not that the donor should leave the organization, but maybe the relationship management should be moved to somebody else? Um, because, you know, we don't always click. And yeah, we, I yeah. Know that. yeah we, we don't even, we don't always click. And I think when, when we talked a little bit about handling or embracing objections in, in one of the other shows, yeah. one of the hidden objections <laughs> from donors is often this not liking of, for whatever reason, the development professional that they're working with. Uh, or sometimes they may be super passionate about the mission and not really like, you know, the, the CEO or executive director, again, for, for whatever reason, yeah. who, who knows what, you know, what that might be. Um, but I think, again, when, when we talk about this being based on relationships, you know, pretty, er pretty early on in the process of building the relationship, if you're a good fit. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if we're talking about releasing a donor, we're talking about a circumstance or situation that goes beyond the relationship, uh, the one-on-one -on -one relationship with the development professional. Uh, mm -hmm. So then I, I do think that it, it takes a conversation with, you know, the board chair, uh, you know, the CEO and the development professional, the three of them to have a conversation about the donor, next steps, 
who wants to carry the torch before we kind of put it out or transfer it right to to another organization. So and, and when I mention things, when I say things like transfer or or, you know, recommend them to another organization, it's not that you're trying to pass along a problem. But again, we don't want folks to lose interest in philanthropy and giving. And uh, I would rather introduce them to another organization and hope that it works out well than to create some scenario that gives them a bad experience that one doesn't look good for my organization that I'm supporting uh, and doesn't look good for the sector as a whole. Yeah, I love that. I think that's that's amazing. And I also think too, you know, this is a new discussion that needs to be had as we have this aging population of wealthy people in our country that are leaving, you know, the workaday world, they're moving more into retirement or they're scaling back. They're going to have more resources and time and time to invest in this way, you know, invest themselves. I mean, you hear this all the time, Tony, you know, people that are like, you know, I'm leaving corporate America because I want to have an encore uh, you know, career in philanthropy or, you know, in, investing my money in, in philanthropy. And so this is, a, this is not um, a story that's one and done. I think it's just really kind of going to be ramping up here. And um, I think it's really, it's been amazing to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much. No, thank you. It was a really interesting topic. So thank you. Yeah, it really is. And, and you know, I think to our viewers and our listeners, um, you know, reach back out to us where you have struggled or what you have seen, because I think we'll be chatting about this more, Tony, and um, it's, it's going to be part of the, the ecosystem of how we manage our nonprofits. Uh, you know, the, just the concept of having a gift policy <laughs> and the MOUs, the memo of understandings with folks that are going to be doing, you know, larger investments or in, maybe have naming rights or endowments, um, endowed, you know, titles. Um, I'm seeing that more and more in my community. I don't know about you in Florida, but where, um, you know, major donors are endowing the salaries of the CEOs. Um, and then that's a named, you know, an, a named piece and um, sure. fascinating, a super cool thing to do. Imagine if you had an organization and you never had to worry about where the CEO salary was going to come from. I, that's just, I, I love hearing stories about that. <laughs> yeah, we're seeing that um, here. And, and, and I mean, it, it happens a lot in the university system and why it's taken us so long <laughs> in the nonprofit sector, you know, and it, to, to, to do this, but you think about it endowed chairs, you see that all over the university system. And it's um, true. It's so true. We well, I, I, I think in today's environment, folks are more aware of not only where their money's going mm -hmm. and to what type of organizations and businesses they're supporting, but I also think they're more aware of where their money's coming from yeah. um, and, and kind of, you know, thinking about uh, how that sits with them. Uh, yeah you know, individually. So I think it, I think it's very true. Well, this has been riveting. And again, I want to make sure that we end the week with a, a big shout out of gratitude to our presenting sponsors, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out so we can have these riveting conversations. You know, Tony, our sponsors do not extend any pressure um, when it comes to our content. And, and I would use the word editorial direction. Um, and that's pretty magical because the conversation we've had to, today about exactly. invest, investors in, enforcing or impacting what you talk about. And, you know, I have competitors on all the time for, you know, to our presenting sponsors that come on and talk about their work and their businesses and their products. And, um, that's really magical. That's magical that we have that environment. Well, I, I've, I've often said on the on the many times and thank you again, the many times that I've been able to be on on the show with with you and others, that these folks are doing more than sponsoring. 
the nonprofit show. They are actively showing their support and commitment to the betterment of the entire sector. Uh, by supporting this this show, so kudos to them. Yeah, thank you. I agree. I agree. I, I think it's it's magical and um and something we appreciate. Well, you've as always, Tony Bell, Mister Nonprofit Consultancy, have totally like given me some hair on fire moments. I love ending my week with you. So you give me things to think about over the weekend and and how I frame up my next week's. Uh, worth of work. I'm very, very interested in this topic. And um, like I said, I think we'll revisit it. So as we end every episode, we like to end with this mantra. And it says simply to stay well, so you can do well. Thank you.